This year, Britain is uniting to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. It's an amazing achievement. We're never, ever going to see a monarch reign for 70 years again. During her remarkable seven decades on the throne, Queen Elizabeth II has reigned over monumental social and political change. But one constant throughout her long, illustrious life has been her greatest of all passions, horses. Some wags have even suggested that when she was born, she was sitting on a rocking horse. That's how much horses mean to her. I think really they're part of her DNA. Any time she ran horses, actually, it's when I think we see her um, probably at her most natural. Our monarch has been a phenomenally successful racehorse owner for over 60 years. And it's going to be a royal victory, I think, on the near side of That's her great love, to breed a horse that goes on to win. And if it's first past the post, then she's really leaping for joy. Her majestic ceremonial steeds take centre stage at momentous state occasions watched by millions. It makes a difference that they're the Queen's horses. She's very observant. If there's something wrong, she's very likely to see it. And even at home, Her Majesty is rarely far from her beloved purebred ponies. Any person who's dedicated their lives as she has for the public good needs to relax. When she is there, being a groom, she's not Elizabeth the monarch, she's not Elizabeth opening Parliament. It's a space where she can be Elizabeth the Rider. All the Queen's horses have captured her heart. To get to know her love for horses is to truly understand the Queen. One of Her Majesty the Queen's most loved pastimes is horse racing, a sport that she has long excelled in. There are very few people in the country who know more about racing than the Queen. She has that skill and knowledge from decades and decades and decades of studying it. It's her passion. She has the ability of seeing if a horse is lame from a good hundred meters away. That is how knowledgeable she is about horses. The Queen's thoroughbreds have won over 1,600 flat races in the past 70 years and she is rumoured to have made nearly £8 million in prize money. There are various figures bandied around about how much she's earned from racing, but to breed a horse, to get a horse to the track, train it every week, deal with its injuries, the vet, the farrier. There's a saying in racing that if you want to make a, a small fortune, start with a big one. To date, our monarch has won most of the big races, including the Gold Cup at Ascot, as well as four out of the five of the British classics, some of them multiple times. The Queen knows exactly what it takes to breed a top-class racehorse, and that's why she's had so much success. And in 2021, the Queen's horses ran over 150 races, with 33 wins, making it one of her most successful years on the race course so far. Horse racing is a passion that Elizabeth II inherited from her father, King George VI, along with a thoroughbred that would prove to be one of her first equine loves. Shortly after her father died, obviously she took over all of his horses and she stumbled across a horse back then called Oriole, who was a fantastic horse. Oriole would have been one of the, the Queen's best colts, probably one of the best colts she's ever had. He was quite a naughty colt, I think. Often chestnuts have slightly high spirits. Despite his flighty temperament, Oriol became the Queen's first top-class racehorse. When he was entered into the 1953 Epsom Derby, she had high hopes for him. Oriol seemed to be in a state of great excitement, but then who wasn't? would have been just a few weeks after her coronation, Oriole lined up for the derby. 27 runners got away on this, the 174th renewal of the derby stakes, leading from a bunch of horses that included Oriole, Premonition and Pinza. Oriole was hugely fancied, ran incredibly well, and finished second to a horse called Pinza. It was that close. But the finish was all Pinza, who went on to pass the post four lengths ahead of the Queen's Oriole and alone in the picture. It was obviously most excited, even if victory had eluded her. 
sadly, the fairy tale didn't quite come true. But he actually went on to become a champion Tsar in the 60s as well, so he had great longevity as a, a flag bearer for the Queen. The near miss marked the start of what was to become one of the Queen's greatest unfulfilled ambitions, to win the Epsom Derby. Oh, tantalizingly, the Derby is the one gap on the Queen's CV. She's won all the other British classics, and she's come so close. The Queen has never won the Epsom Derby, and there is no doubt that she would dearly love to add that string to her bow. She's had some very many good horses that have been nearly great, but the one that must itch her at night is that she still hasn't won the Derby. In the run-up to the June 2022 Epsom Derby, all hopes were pinned on one particular horse of the Queen. Reach for the Moon would be most people's idea of Her Majesty's most likely runner in this year's Derby. I think he's the sort of horse who looks as if he'll be quite versatile as far as ground conditions go. Reach for the Moon is trained by John Gosden, who's absolutely one of the greatest trainers training horses today. Reach for the Moon started racing last year as a two-year-old. It went to really quite an important race called the Solario Stakes. It won very easily indeed. And at that point, everyone started getting excited and beginning to wonder whether this could be the horse that fulfilled the dream. Bred by the Queen at her Sandringham stud, Reach for the Moon was sired by another of Her Majesty's champion thoroughbreds, the hugely successful See the Stars. It's, it's one thing to own a horse that wins the Derby, to actually breed it as well is the sort of holy grail in horse racing. The Epsom Derby has been hailed as one of the greatest horse races in the world, and it dates back at least 240 years. Racing has taken place on these downs here at Epsom in some organized form since the 1660s, under the reign of Charles II. I mean, the very first derby was run here in 1780. It's an incredible race course, a roller coaster of a track over a mile and a half. It stood the test of time. The Epsom Derby has a reputation as what I would say was the, the people's race. It's a vast, sprawling spectacle. The national anthems play, the crowds are cheering, but it's the royal patronage that's so important. The Queen's presence on Derby Day is, is a marvellous thing. She's attended all bar four derbies since the late 1940s. Her presence has, in that time added hugely to the prestige of the day, the enjoyment of the crowd on the day, the joy and the, the enthusiasm of the, of the crowd, particularly lining this home straight as the Queen arrives here is, is really, really something to behold and something very special. And what a tremendous ovation there was for the Queen and the Duke when they arrived and drove along the course. And very little has changed in the past 70 years of Her Majesty's attendance. The Queen's vehicle enters the race course at the top of Tattenham Corner, drives right the way down on the race course, spectators from the race course lining the rail, waving, Oh, it's a vehicle just here, exits the car. That's when we play the national anthem. Full stand, looking down, welcoming Her Majesty to the race course for the day. Comes past the winner's enclosure and then makes her way up into the Royal Box in the main Queen stand. It's a real hive of activity in here on Derby Day morning. Clearly the room doesn't look like this. Her Majesty's party will arrive to set up with chefs, with waiting staff early in the morning. This will be her viewing point for the racing during the day and the derby itself. The Queen, quite rightly, has the best seat in the house. From her position here, really does get to see how the race unfolds. And then, fantastically, right on the finish line. So, if the photo finish device doesn't work, Perhaps we can ask Her Majesty. This book is presented on a table every year and has all of the winners from previous derbies. 
that the Queen really does enjoy flicking through all of those winners every year. The unfortunate thing is that the Queen doesn't have her own winner in this book yet. In addition to the winner's book, there's another highly coveted place to be seen at Epsom, the winner's circle. The place everyone wants to be at Epsom Racecourse, on every race, but particularly the Derby, is in that very famous grass circle in there. Certainly going back to pictures of the, of the 1930s derbies, there's always been a sort of circular and rather unique winner's enclosure at Epsom. This is where the, the recipient will collect their trophy. Once the more formal pieces have done around that, that celebration, we can welcome the winning connections into, into an area we, we call the gladiator room. So the gladiator room is where, if you've had a winner here at Epsom, this is where you'll come with your winning connections, owner, trainer, um, and the people around the race course to come and celebrate your success. Sadly, Reach for the Moon struggled to recover from an injury, and just one month before the big race, the Queen's horse was out of the running, leaving her derby dream as yet unfulfilled. Her Majesty's horses are always ridden by jockeys wearing silks in the Queen's colours. The instantly recognisable combination has a very rich history. It's red and it's purple, and that is going back to George V and his colours. But most importantly, purple in particular is always the colour of a royal. We have to remember that in the Tudor period, people were forbidden from wearing purple if they weren't royal. So I love the fact that the Queen, when her jockeys are on horseback, uses the most ostentatious royal colours. They really make a big statement and say, I am the Queen's horse and I am the Queen's jockey. They are colours like nobody else. The, the monarch has different colours. They are so distinctive. And during the race, you will be able to spot wherever her runner is in the race. But can you imagine being a jockey who has to ride for the Queen? The pressure will be enormous. I've had the privilege to ride for Her Majesty on numerous occasions. It's hard to explain the level of, of pride you get when you first wear those colours. She's been involved for such a long time. She's so passionate about the game, and at the end of the day, it, it, is, it is Her Majesty. These are special to the Queen. You can't really get much bigger than that. You really look the part. You can probably feel like you're part of royalty when you're wearing them. The Queen is personally involved with the care of her racehorses, often from the very beginning. She's watched a lot of horses mating. She's been at foals being born. Whenever a mare goes into foal, any time of the day or night, the Queen is alerted and she can now watch it on her iPad. In order to truly understand Her Majesty the Queen, we must first understand her fascination with horses which began when she was just four years old. The Queen's love of horses stemmed from a very early age. Her grandfather, George V, gave her her first Shetland pony, Peggy. And she was plonked on Peggy's back, and mum or dad held her hand. And it's a bit like duck taking to water. The Queen's childhood was one of those aristocratic ones which, in the 1930s, would automatically have horses everywhere. She grew up in a very horsey family and her governess, Marion Crawford, tells of a delightful story. When she first met the young Princess Elizabeth, she was in bed, having used the cord of her dressing gown to create reins on her bedposts, and she was driving a carriage. And Marion Crawford said, do you often drive at night? And the young Elizabeth said, yes, of course I do, twice around the park, they need their exercise. In the early 1940s, the King took her to visit his racehorses, Big Game and Chariot. It's reported that stroking them was such a happy moment for her, she didn't wash her hands for several hours afterwards. Horses were a part of her life, much the same way as youngsters going to school. They're either kicking a football or hitting a ball with a hockey stick or with a tennis racket. Um, that was her sport. 
It wasn't long before the Queen's racing success began. In 1953, she took her horse, Choir Boy, to Royal Ascot. The colt was running in the Royal Hunt Cup. Her Majesty herself was evidently in gay mood as she had a word with her jockey, Doug Smith, who was riding Choir Boy. Choir Boy started well, kept up with the pack, and as the pack moved down the straight, he just ran on. Judging his time nicely, Smith brought Choir Boy along in a strong and successful challenge to beat Brunetto. So this time it was victory for the Queen. Her Majesty, who must certainly have been delighted by her success, went with members of her family to see Choir Boy. Her Majesty was hooked and has since barely missed an opportunity to attend Royal Ascot, the five-day event which takes place every June and sees around 500 horses running a number of different races. I would say Royal Ascot is the pinnacle of flat racing. Everybody wants to be there. It's an intoxicating mix of the very, very best horses taking each other on, all wedded together beautifully with tradition, history. Ascot is, or tends to be, uh, the highlight of the social season. It's a fashion fest. It's a kaleidoscope of colour. Of course, Ascot is all about glamour and hats. Did you get it off the peg or did you have it specially made for you? I had it specially made for Royal Ascot. And there's always a little bit of extra glamour with the Queen because she is at the very heart of Royal Ascot, so it needs to be seen. Every day at Royal Ascot begins with Her Majesty's procession. There's something really magical about the Queen arriving at Royal Ascot in her carriage from her castle, and it's sort of in her back garden. It's like we've all been invited to this amazing party. When the Queen goes to Ascot, she is loving it. It's the first thing in her diary. There's always the rather charming tradition of bookies taking odds on what colour hat the Queen will be wearing, which is great fun. I've from a fashion point of view. No doubt about the winner of this year's Gold Cup. Our monarch has enjoyed 23 Ascot wins, but the pinnacle of her success there came in 2013, when her filly, Estimate, ran in the Gold Cup on Ladies' Day. Estimate had that lovely combination of class and stamina, and um, that obviously gave her an outstanding chance. The buzz before the Gold Cup that year was fantastic, largely because everybody knew Estimate was there with a really good chance. Could the Queen possibly win the Ascot Gold Cup? Winning the prize would be quite the achievement for the Queen, as none of her royal predecessors had managed to in the history of the Gold Cup, which began in 1807. Despite the pressure, the Queen retained her trademark poise. The Queen doesn't do nerves. The Queen doesn't really do apprehension. And she's very pragmatic. If she's got a horse running, She's kind of smiling, and if the horse is near the front, she's smiling even more, and if it's first past the post, then she's really leaping for joy. The crowds witnessed Estimate race to Gold Cup victory, making history for the Queen in the process. It's the first time a reigning monarch had won, and that was in 207 years of the race, so it was extremely exciting. She was clearly so overjoyed. That smile, I'll never, ever forget that smile. If she were to tell me it was the happiest day of her life, you would believe her. You could really see the enthusiasm, the love, the passion in those moments. Absolutely marvellous. The Queen was to have presented the trophy. As it was, the trophy was presented to her. Estimate is now 13 years old and living happily in retirement at Sandringham but the Queen will always remember her achievement. The Queen wanted to commemorate this very special event. So now, an enormous sculpture of Estimate is right at the front entrance of Sandringham. So it is the first thing everyone sees when they go to visit the Queen. I think that tells you what that race meant to her and what that horse means to her. Her Majesty's great success in racing is due in part to the level of personal involvement she has with each of her horses, often from the very beginning. She puts a huge amount of personal work into the racing and breeding. She's watched a lot of horses mating. She's been off always being born. A system was put into place at Sandringham Stud whereby cameras were put up in the folding berths 
and the Queen asked her stud manager, David Summers, if he would give her a call and let her know when a mare was going into foal. And uh, he said, you know, Your Majesty, is that during the night as well? And she said, yes. And so now, whenever a mare goes into foal, any time of the day or night, the Queen is alerted and she can now watch it on her iPad. The breeding is really important to her. You can just go out and buy horses, but she doesn't want to do that. She wants to breed them. That's her great love, to breed a horse that goes on to win. That's the greatest achievement that you can have in racing. And the Queen began breeding horses over six decades ago. The Queen has said to breed a horse that was faster than its competitors gave her an especial thrill. The horses that are running today are horses that she has bred and are descendants of horses that she has been intimately involved in managing for more than 70 years. One of the most famous of the Queen's homebred fillies is Dunfermline. Dunfermline is a special horse for many reasons. Um, she was a filly bred by the Queen. She was a filly who really read the script. And they're racing. She was a filly that came out into her best, you know, over long trips, mile and a half, mile and three quarters, you know, stamina was her forte. In June 1977, just days before another of the Queen's milestone jubilees, one of the famous British classic races, the Oaks, took place. All eyes were on Dunfermline and his jockey, Willie Carson. Willie Carson was a real breath of fresh air, and he, he was a bubbly personality in the saddle. He was a real pushing jockey, and uh, he wanted to win. It was a very, very big day. Dunfermline would be well fancied. She was six to one, but she wasn't the favorite. To go. As the race got underway, Carson and Dunfermline were struggling to get in front. And it's Dunfermline on the near side, having a right battle with Breeze and She managed to hold on by three quarters of a length, which sounds like a small margin, but at the end of a race like that, it's fairly comfortable. And it's Dunfermline on the near side, having a right battle with Breeze and Tinkert. She took a fair time to wear down the others, but she, she did in the end. On the near side, Willie Carson, Dunfermline. And it's going to be a royal victory, I think. On the near side, Dunfermline. And Dunfermline now going into the lead. And Dunfermline wins the oak from Breeze of Secret, vaguely dead. The sad thing was that because of the Silver Jubilee celebrations, it was on a Saturday, and there was a big event at Windsor, so the Queen couldn't actually be there. Though the Queen wasn't present for Dunfermline's victory, she would no doubt have celebrated the success of one of her homebred racehorses. When Dunfermline won, there would have been such exhilaration, and this would have felt wonderful. I think everyone's very proud to have a winner for the Queen, be it the jockey, the lad who looks after the horse, the trainer, and, you know, and everyone who's involved, really, in the stables, because people are keen to do well for her, and, uh, and I think are, are pleased for her that, you know, they've managed to get it right and have a winner. When Dunfermline went on to win the St. Ledger three months later at Doncaster, the Queen made history once again. To win two classes in one year is unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's terrific. It was one of the highest points, if not the highest point, of the whole of the Queen's racing interest. It's not just her precious thoroughbreds that the Queen is devoted to. Her ceremonial steeds have seen her through thick and thin, most notably in 1981 when our monarch's life was placed in danger. Shots were fired from the crowd. This could have been a tragedy. ceremonial horses have held a special place in her heart throughout her 70-year reign, performing on the world stage in magnificent displays of pomp and ceremony. These are the horses of the Household Cavalry. The Household Cavalry are essentially the Queen's bodyguards. They're the, composed of the lifeguards and the Blues and Royals. The lifeguards are the senior regiment of the British Army. They accompany the sovereign as uh, her escort on state occasions, state visits, the opening of parliament, and the like. Obviously now, in terms of 
21st century, the Queen doesn't need a mounted guard outside her palace. They are now there for ceremonial reasons and historical reasons. But you go back just 100 years, those men would have been literally protecting the monarch's life. So it is a very, very important job within the British Army. And their barracks at Hyde Park is very close to Buckingham Palace. And the Queen would often go and visit the horses when she was in residence. One such visit took place in October 2017, when Her Majesty was given a tour of the cavalry stables and clearly enjoyed spending time with the horses. The Queen was presented with the horse that she had gifted them, who had been in special training. The horse formerly known as Joni, Majesty. And the Queen made some comments about what she looked like, how she was coming on, and gave Joni a polo. It was very, very sweet. She was very animated. It was one of the only times I've seen her take off her glove. One of the tasks it said Her Majesty finds most enjoyable in her role as Colonel in Chief of the Household Cavalry is to formally inspect the troops at her annual official birthday parade. It's a centuries-old royal tradition known as Trooping the Colour. Trooping the Colour goes back to when it was the monarch's job to review the troops. And that has really been the monarch's job for as long as there has been a monarchy. It's a rather charming tradition. There's no military parade like it. The colour refers to the historic use of the British Army's regimental flags once used as rallying points for troops in battle. It had an important purpose because on the battlefield, in the smoke and carnage of war, very often uh, it was not possible to distinguish friend from foe. Like the colour delineated where your regiment, so to speak, actually was. Today, the parade is simply a celebration of the sovereign, a grand display of military precision featuring 1,400 servicemen, a royal flypast, and, to Her Majesty's obvious delight, 200 horses. The Queen loves Troop in the Colour. I think you can really see her love of the horses and her love of the whole kind of pomp and circumstance. This is where horses are used in a very official capacity. The livery, everything is polished within an inch of its life. The bridle, the tack, the saddle, the boots have to shine. I think the attention to detail on the parade is such that she really appreciates all the effort that is put into it. And I, I think she loves it. It's a perfect birthday present for her. And for the first 34 years of her reign, the Queen played a starring role on horseback, always riding side saddle. In 1969, Her Majesty debuted her newest horse in the parade, a half thoroughbred, half Hanoverian mare named Burmese. Her bond with Burmese was to become one of the greatest equine partnerships the world has ever seen. She was given Burmese by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in the 1960s, and she was an amazing horse and was one of her favourites. The Queen rode it every year for 18 consecutive seasons, which is a considerable amount of time for a horse to serve. Burmese will always have a very special place, both in the Queen's hearts and in the nation's hearts. It was the Queen's close relationship with Burmese that helped avoid disaster at the 1981 Trooping of the Colour, when a gunman suddenly opened fire. A man came out and fired some blanks at the pair. The horse obviously spooked. Scotland Yard spokesman said that 17-year-old Marcus Simon Sargent had been charged with willfully discharging a cartridge pistol in the vicinity of Her Majesty the Queen, intent on alarming her. She showed admirable composure as a horsewoman, and in point of fact, it was hardly possible to notice from the way she handled her horse that there had been this serious problem. The Queen was so quick to reassure her lovely mare, and it was very instinctive and very empathetic, and it was the mark of a true horsewoman, someone who knows what they're doing, and who has grown up with horses and has been around them forever. It was very instinctive. She just carried on, cool as a cucumber, didn't let it face her or Burmese at all. Very impressive. Just one year later, Burmese saw the Queen through another seismic event 
a visit from the US president during the ongoing war in the Falklands. She and President Reagan spent an hour in the saddle together when he visited Britain in 1982. There's little doubt that Reagan greatly enjoyed it. Diplomatically, this was a very significant moment. President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher are well known to have got on, but the fact that the Queen was able to extend the warmth of a welcome that he regarded as very special is, I think, very significant. He had given enormous help to Britain during the Falklands campaign, without which, it has been argued, Britain might not have been able to retake the islands. Burmese retired in 1986, but the Queen is unlikely to forget the important role her favourite horse played on that historic day. Forty years on, Her Majesty's ceremonial horses are about to take to the world stage once again, as the household cavalry prepare for the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. To get to the standard for all parades where Her Majesty will be on, we'll go through several drills and rehearsals. Knowing on that final parade, Her Majesty the Queen will be looking, observing and watching, uh, fills you with uh, immense pride. She's done this more than anyone else on parade. She knows exactly everything that should be happening, when it should be happening. She will spot something out of place and pass that back down to us. So with that pressure, we work on that and drill ourselves so we know nothing can go wrong. The Queen's love for horses and her knowledge comes into what happens after every trooping. She's been known to feed back to the commanding officers very minute details about how the parade went. If the parade hasn't been up to standard, the person responsible will certainly hear about it. Around 300 of the cavalry's members worked tirelessly to perfect the parade for Her Majesty. Among them are six saddlers creating every hand-stitched saddle from scratch, a task that can take around 60 hours per saddle. We use traditional methods. The saddle has to be bespoke made for each of those individual horses. That's the same with the actual head kits. You can't buy that kit. In the forge, 15 farriers work as a 24-hour team to shoe every one of the cavalry's 260 horses in time for the procession. It makes a difference that they're the Queen's horses. She's very observant. If there's something wrong, the Queen's done so many parades and things that she's very likely to see it. Leading the troops in the parade and carrying priceless antique solid silver instruments will be the shires that are used as the cavalry's majestic drum horses. The drum horses themselves have a unique role at the front, and they have to be steadfast on parade, because when the band's behind them, um, you know, 52 strong, they're relying on the drum horses to be able to continue that music and to, to set the pace for the drummers. It's got an itch. The drum horses themselves, when they're dressed up for Her Majesty and when they're in their silver drums, they do hold a rank of major, um, and they should be saluted. So they are considered one of the more important horses in the regiment. As official members of the British Army, these horses are given military names personally selected by Her Majesty. When they finish their training, what we do with, with some careful vetting is put some names forward that we would suggest. We then give them a formal name, which is historically after Greek or Roman figures, gods, um, just to sort of emphasize that prowess. Um, calling a drum horse cuddles doesn't exactly go down too well. So, you know, we have the likes of uh, Achilles and Perseus. Despite the meticulous attention to detail, there's no guaranteeing the horses will stick to the plan, not even at a royal wedding watched by millions. It's quite high pressure, it's quite high octane, and horses can be unpredictable. It doesn't really matter how well trained they are. One of the Queen's favourite breeds, the Shire Horse, has been linked to the royal family for centuries. King Henry VIII bred Shires in an attempt to create the ultimate war horse, 
to demonstrate the strength and might of the Tudor dynasty. And the majestic presence of shires has long been a staple at important royal occasions. So where does Her Majesty's household cavalry find their ceremonial shires? The surprising answer is at farms like Divard in rural Wales, who've been supplying the Queen's cavalry for over 13 years. The Shire horse is a rare breed. There are not many of them about, so I think it's very important for the, the breed that to imagine the Queen takes such a keen interest in the Shire horse. To be able to claim that we've supplied the royal family with a drum horse for several occasions is something we take pride on. Today, there's about 1,500 breeding mares registered with the Shire Horse Society. There are fewer Shires being kept and owned and bred by people because they are an expensive animal to keep. These are horses that are literally becoming rarer than the giant panda. And these are horses that we need to preserve. They're part of our heritage. Um, we need to preserve the genetic diversity. And it is brilliant that through the royal family, the, these horses are showcased and are kept in the public eye. There's two family trees up on the wall. One is a human family tree, which is the boring one without the photographs, which. Uh, indicate our family having been here on this farm since 1849. And then this is the bloodline of the Devonshire horse farm breed, which uh, goes back formally to the late 1970s, early 1980s, when my grandfather began to formally breed Shire horses after he retired. To successfully continue the bloodlines of such a rare breed is achievement enough. But to breed animals with exactly the size and temperament needed to become a member of the household cavalry is no mean feat. The farm's latest shire to join the cavalry is even more special. Standing at over 18 hands, eight-year-old Willa Rose is making equine history. Willa is uh, our only mare that we have here. What makes her unique is, is out of the cohort of male drum horses, you know, she's our first mare um, in, in, in a long time. We, we have made the purchase of mares in the past, but then the mare temperament sometimes can cause problems. Historically, we generally go for geldings. Uh, they're a little bit easier to predict. So there was an element of, of hesitation when we, we bought our, the only mare into the fold, but it's, it's proved worthwhile. Over the years, the farm has provided Her Majesty's cavalry with three of their five drum horses. But preparing each young shire for intensive ceremonial training takes Hugh and his family years of hard labour. On the farm, we break the horses into ride and also drive, and also do a bit of light farm work. We all use them to turn the hay on occasions as well. A shire horse will weigh anything between 800 kilograms and 1,000, so anything up to, up to a tonne and to carry the kettle drums and all the harness and the rider takes a big, strong horse. When you dress a shire horse up in all his harness, we'll say for a state occasion with the kettle drums and a rider, it makes a very impressive sight. Another shire sent all the way from the farm to the royal stables to perform for the Queen but yet to be given his military name is the horse currently known as Ed. Ed is the new boy that's going to be going on parade this year. We're we'll working hard to get him ready for the Jubilee season. He's been good as gold. You know, there's, there's no two ways about it. Um, moving to London from the, from the heart of Wales, uh, as, I can, as anyone can imagine, the traffic, buses, you know, he's taking it all in his stride. His training, as I said, he's been fantastic. He absorbed it all um, and settled straight away. He's, he's nice and strong, which is a good thing. You know, he's, he's shown no problems with carrying any sort of weight. You know, hopefully we can make up for the fact he's, he's missing the beach in Wales, but we'll get to take him to the beaches in Norfolk this summer, so he'll, he'll earn his break. Ed started moving in royal circles early, meeting Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, at Divard in 2018. To Royal Highness, I took in a horse and cart ride and also had a tour of the farm. She was accompanied at the time for a brief period by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. They arrived by helicopter at the Queen's flight and uh, it was a, a very enjoyable day. She began giving polo mints to the horses and we have quite a no sweets policy for the horses here. But we decided we'd bend the rule on that day. If Her Royal Highness deemed it appropriate to give the horses polo mints, then the horses could have their polo mints. 
so they certainly enjoyed her visit. And the farm's royal connections don't stop there. The 25th Shire horse to be born at Divard Farm was foaled on the 21st of April 2020, the Queen's 94th birthday. We decided uh, that as the foal was born on her birthday, we would invite Her Majesty to uh, give a name to this foal. She accepted our request and she uh, named it Guinevere. We were quite surprised and uh, touched for her to pick it out and uh, take the time to respond to it in the way she did is, is something we're quite pleased and quite proud about. If Guinevere becomes the second Divid Mare to join the ranks of the Household Cavalry, she can look forward to receiving world-class care as well as a warm welcome from Her Majesty. But despite the careful breeding and intensive coaching of all the Queen's steeds, occasionally one of them will go rogue. Usually a royal event is seamless and flawless. We notice only when something does go wrong. The British are the best in the ceremonial field, and there's no question that the household cavalry and horses are very central to this. So obviously you expect perfection. Very occasionally you can get a surprise. When Prince William wed Kate Middleton at Westminster Abbey in April 2011, the ceremony and procession were viewed by over 36 million people around the globe. For one of the horses, the pressure proved too much. As Kate and William left Westminster Abbey as the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, there was a massive procession with many, many riders. One of the horses got spooked, bucked his rider, and then made a beeline back for the muse at, at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and actually overtook Kate and William's carriage. And they just carried on very coolly, just waving, just carried on, ignored it. It's quite high pressure, it's quite high octane, and horses can be unpredictable. It doesn't really matter how well trained they are. Of course, the Queen's horses are going to be, they're going to be well mannered, but they have a brain, they have a life of their own. I think the Queen would always have sympathy for a horse. Every horse or pony can have an off day. And sometimes, like all of us, a horse or a pony can wake up on the wrong side of bed and just decide, you know what, today, I'm not going to do what my rider tells me, even if I've been watched by millions and millions of people on television around the world. I don't care. In May of 2018, another naughty horse tried to upstage Meghan Markle at her Windsor wedding to Prince Harry. After they left St George's Chapel in the grounds of Windsor Castle, they were taken by a state coach in a procession with Windsor Greys through the streets of Windsor. There was a cheeky Windsor Grey at the front who did not want to stay on track. And these riders are the best, really struggling to try and keep this horse literally on track. And of course, it became a bit of a social media sensation and everyone said, oh, the horse stole the show and look at the, look at the cheeky horse. I think the Queen probably finds that an occasional glitch is rather a change from a routine. After all, it's so much goes so seamlessly. Sometimes when something goes wrong, so long as it is not an unkind or embarrassing episode, it can be funny. The Queen loves it when things go wrong or when there's something like a funny incident, particularly if it involves a horse. And sometimes it's not just the royals who steal the show, it's the horses. It's the year that we celebrate our sovereign's seven decades on the throne. It's an amazing achievement. This is a very historic occasion. We're never, ever going to see a monarch reign for 70 years again. Next time, we find out where the Queen's hardworking horses go to retire after life on the world stage. We had to have sanction to say that we wanted to retire them. And she wanted to know why we were retiring them and, of course, where they were going. And how being a great horsewoman is not just part of Her Majesty's public persona, but also a private passion. I think we're all very, very grateful that she has this escape from what must be one of the most demanding jobs in the world.
front who did not want to stay on track. And these riders are the best, really struggling to try and keep this horse off, literally on track. And of course it became a bit of a social media sensation and everyone's like, oh, of course, sold the show and look at the, look at the cheeky horse. I think the Queen probably finds that an occasional glitch is rather than a change from the routine. After all, it's so much to go so seamless. Sometimes when something goes wrong, someone that is not an unkind or embarrassing episode, it can be fun. The Queen loves it when things go wrong or when there's something like a funny incident, particularly if it involves a horse. And sometimes, it's not just the royal who needs to do the show, it's the horses. It's the year that we celebrate our sovereign's seven decades on the throne. It's an amazing achievement. This is a very historic occasion. We're never ever going to see a monarch reign 70 years ago. Next time, we find out where the Queen's hard-working horses go to retire after life on the world stage. We had to have sanctions to say that we want to retire them. We want to make my wife retire them. who did not want to stay on track. And these riders are the best, really struggling to try and keep this horse literally on track. And of course it became a bit of a social media sensation and everyone's like, oh, the horse stole the show and look at the, look at the cheeky horse. I think the Queen probably finds that an occasional glitch is rather a change from the routine. After all, it's so much goes so seamlessly. Sometimes when something goes wrong, so long as it is not an unkind or embarrassing episode, it can be funny. The Queen loves it when things go wrong or when there's something like a funny incident, particularly if it involves a horse. And sometimes it's not just the royals who steal the show, it's the horses. It's the year that we celebrate our sovereign seven decades on the throne. It's an amazing achievement. This is a very historic occasion. We're never ever going to see a monarch reign for 70 years again. Next time we find out where the Queen's hardworking horses go to retire after life on the world stage. We had to have sanction to say that we wanted to retire them. And she wanted to know why we were retiring them and of course where they were going and how being a great horsewoman is not just part of Her Majesty's public persona, but also a private passion. I think we're all very, very grateful that she has this escape from what must be one of the most demanding jobs in the world.